in conversation with Joseph Sassoon, the director of the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies and professor of history and political economy at Georgetown University. He holds the Al Sabah Chair in Politics and Political Economy of the Arab World. He's also a senior associate member of St. Anthony's College, Oxford. In 2013, his book, Saddam Hussein's Ba'ath Party, uh, Inside an Authoritarian Regime, won the prestigious British Kuwait Prize for the best book on the Middle East. Sassoon completed his PhD at St. Anthony's College at Oxford. He's published extensively on Iraq and the economy of the Middle East. The Sassoon's, his fifth book, is a finalist for the Jewish Book Award. And it is uh, rewarding to have him here as part of this conversation to, to talk about what I'm going to cut to the chase is a marvelous book. Uh, it's marvelous in how it, it tells the story and expands the story uh, over, o over a century of the rise, the journeys, uh, the great achievements, and the gradual deterioration and breakup of the Sassoon family or that branch of the Sassoon family. The story is almost archetypal. Uh, in some ways, it's a, we see a family that was comfortable in Baghdad being driven out to Basra by the Ottoman Turks, making a fortune in Bombay, picking up the opium trade, and we'll get into that, making a huge fortune, and then by the third generation begin to lose it. While no two stories are the same, uh, I'm reminded in reading the book of the Lehman Brothers trilogy as family dynamics and business dynamics change from generation to generation along with assimilation. And I couldn't help but be reminded also, uh, maybe strangely, of uh, Muhammad al-Fayed, the father of Dodi, uh, Princess Lady Di's uh, boyfriend, and their attempt to find their way, if not buy their way, through charity into British society. It's a story that has uh, that that has some antecedents. Uh, got a lot of glamour and glitterati and drama, and uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be in conversation with you, Joseph. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Jonathan, for the kind introduction, and thank you to the American Jewish University for hosting me. I'm going to share with you some slides and quickly tell you a little bit about the story, if you don't mind, um, because this would be uh, okay. So um, this is where they came from, the family. Baghdad, 19th century, there was a Jewish community going back all the way 2,500 years. Um, actually, in 1824, a few years before the founder, David Sassoon, left Baghdad, a rabbi was visiting there, and the Jews were about 7,000 out of a total population in the city of 50,000, and they had all the prominent positions in, in the city. Baghdad was, of course, a province of the Ottoman Empire, and David Sassoon's father was the tax collector. In today's world, we call it the uh, Secretary of Treasury or the Minister of Finance. His job was to collect taxes in the province on behalf of the Sultan. And you are the, 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 this is a very important job that was appointed by a decree from Constantinople, the capital of the Ottoman Empire. This is the founder, David Sassoon. Um, he fled Baghdad because at the time there was a corrupt governor that was embezzling money from merchant families. There were many erroneous uh, stories at the time that there were, and members of the family sometimes repeated it. Um, I did some research in the Ottoman archives. They did not leave because of anti-Semitism. They left because they were being harassed by this corrupt governor and um, he and his father fled. In fact, his siblings 
stayed behind in Baghdad. I'm the descendant of one of those siblings. Um, David and his father fled. They went to what is now Iran, Persia at the time. They stayed there for a year. The old father died. David Sassoon took his younger family of two children, uh, four children, uh, two boys and two girls to Bombay. He also, his first wife died at a very young age um, after the birth of their fourth child. He married again and from his second wife had 10 children. So in total, 14 children, which I say in the book that basically it constituted a small army when he was creating the network. Um, one of the most fascinating things and what led me to do this book is finding tens and tens of thousands of these documents. No one has used them for a simple reason. It's hard to decode. You need to know three languages. You need to know the Baghdadi Jewish dialect. You need to know Arabic and you need to know Hebrew. And of course, you need to decode the handwriting. Um, this is a typical letter. They were incredible copious correspondence between all the brothers and the fathers. It is really amazing how much time must have been spent on writing this. And remember when you were corresponding and you were copying the brothers and other people, you have to copy again the letter. Um, but this is really typical. These tend to be very formal in the beginning, but then they move on to the uh, uh, business. Um, David Sassoon, from the beginning, decided to throw his lot with the British Empire. He served its colonial interests throughout uh, Asia um, and the Middle East. He was granted a British citizenship in 1853, not having stepped um in, in Britain. And actually, he learned Hindustani in addition to his other four languages of Arabic, Hebrew, Persian, and Ottoman, but never learned English and in fact signed his oath of allegiance in Hebrew. These are the main characters. There are other sub characters in subplots in the book. This is the founder whom I just talked about, his son Abdullah who um, in 1872 was knighted by Queen Victoria and became known as Sir Albert. By the way, without exception, almost everyone um, changed and anglicized their name. Elias, the second son, who refused upon the death of the father to concede to Albert being the only a chairman. Uh, he wanted a 50-50 split. Three years of haggling ended up in having two competing companies, both carrying the name Sassoon, David Sassoon and Co. and E.D. Sassoon and Co. And it is part of the story how this competition worked out over the next 70, 80 years. One of the most fascinating aspects that I discovered in this book, and I have a whole chapter, is about Farha, flora. You know, you do not find at the end of the 19th century uh, a woman who was running a global company. She was the CEO of this massive trading company with very sophisticated investment across the world. Um, and fortunately, the men in the family didn't like her success and her uh, rising prestige consistently conspired against her until they pushed her out. That actually augured the beginning of the end of one side of the family, the David Sassoon uh, and co. Uh, the other family continued, uh, the other side continued to prosper. And one of its people who really took it to very high levels is Victor Sassoon, who moved from India to China in the 1920s, built an emp another empire in real estate in Shanghai. There are buildings that are still in uh, uh, Shanghai carrying the name Sassoon. As I said, there are many other personalities, but these are the main characters. Um, one of the most fascinating things about David Sassoon, his adherence to Judaism, 
and his belief in philanthropy. Um, he initiated something very, very critical, which really was innovative. A quarter of 1% tax on every trade that the family has done, irrelevant whether the trade is um, profitable or not. Quarter of 1% doesn't sound a lot of money, but when you are doing hundreds, if not thousands of trades, a lot of money accumulated. Synagogues, schools, not just for Jewish city, uh, Jewish communities, but across the board. If you go today to Mumbai, you will find hospitals under the name Sassoon. You will find schools. You will find a beautiful library that exists. These are two. He built that, uh, which is a, a functioning synagogue in, in uh, Mumbai today. Um, this is the other one in Pune, which is about four hours away from Bombay, where he spent uh, the last few years, and he's actually buried in the grounds of the Ohel David. Um, similar to European families, they created their emblem. Uh, trust was critical at that period before all global merchants, hence Emet Ve Emuna, which translate in uh, 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 Latin to Candida Constante. There are religious symbols. There are symbols from Baghdad, the palm tree, um, and it becomes their emblem throughout that period. This is a map that shows you how incredible their expansion within 30 years after arriving in Bombay. Um, in Across all the ports uh, of the, the different places, Three major stars, these are the major hubs. Stop. First hub was Bombay, second hub, Shanghai, third hub in London. Um, the honors that were bestowed on members of the family, first, as I said, Albert became a sir, then the city of London. And remember, there was only one superpower at the time in the 1850s, 1860s, that was Britain. Um, and the city of London, without any doubt, was the center of capitalism and trade across the whole world. Um, they honored him by, and he was the first Jew ever to be honored by the city of London. This picture um, shows you what happened to the third and fourth generation. Utter assimilation, part of the upper class in, in Britain, estates in Scotland, um, huge houses in London and the country. They wanted really to live and be part of the life of the British aristocracy. And it caused obviously the demise of the dynasty because they lost their identity, but they lost also their work ethic and attachment to the business. Um, on the other side, in the 1920s, 30s, Victor Sassoon, Build the first skyscraper in um, on the Bund, which is the main road street in Shanghai, still exists today. It's a beautiful building. It's now the Fairmont Peace Hotel, um, and it's still a very, very distinctive um, building in Shanghai. He was a very, very um, flamboyant tycoon. Um, loved the li uh, high life. Um, hobnobbed with all the different people in Hollywood um, and had uh, Marlon Dietrich was one of his girlfriends. I'm going to end now here so we can go to the questions. Well, thank you. And I don't mean to appear shallow, but the pictures in the book are remarkable because while the book tells a story in an interesting and compelling way, the pictures show the story. You can see the assimilation as it is happening, as the costumes change, as the names change. And uh, you can understand the tensions that are showing up uh, in the family. And it, it's it's really pretty remarkable. Uh, even to me, when they were on the brink of losing their empire, one of the things that struck me when I was in Shanghai, when I was introduced, really introduced to the uh, to the family and the idea of the family is the reverence with which they are still spoken. 
and their presence uh, in Shanghai and learning about the same kind of reverence and pre and uh, prestige that they retain, or at least up until a year or two ago in Hong Kong and Bombay was uh, pre pretty uh, startling. Uh, the scope of their charitable work, which you showed with some of the synagogues, uh, could you expand on that, particularly in terms of uh, the, their importance to Jews escaping the Shoah? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, it's interesting. Shanghai uh, I, I was the only city left in the world that was open to the Jews without any need for a visa. So Jews leaving and escaping Europe um, in, in the 1930s, one of the biggest issues that faced every family is the, where to go. First, there was no visas, and then how do you get there? Obviously, the problem still was there how to get to Shanghai. But unlike any other place in the world, if Jews who arrived were safe, were never thrown out, and I talk about it in the book, Victor Sassoon played a very important role as one of the tycoons that were living there. Um, of course, there was a lot of pressure in the city. And at one point, the system almost was collapsed. He and others said, we can't take any more. We need to regulate it. But at the same time, he contributed a lot to help uh, financially. He started a scheme of training for the young ones and all kind of uh, uh, jobs that these people uh, could do. And, and the ghetto that existed there still today is protected uh, uh, as a historical site. The, uh, one of the issues that shows up in a small amount on the emblem, the coat of arms, was their entry and the fortune that they made uh, eventually, uh, controversially, uh, in the opium trade. And I wondered if you'd go on with the context of the opium trade. And even after the nature of the opium tra trade changed, how there is still that reverence uh, in China uh, for, for them. And it seems to me to be a very interesting story arc about uh, the role of the uh, English, not the Anglican, but some of the English churches, uh, as well as the taking over of the opium trade by the Chinese. So if you would uh, introduce us to opium. Sure. So opium have been used for thousands of years in India and China, uh, in China for both recreational and medicinal uh, even today in 2023, uh, mothers in a lot of countryside in India, when their babies are teething, they give them a little tiny bit on, on their fingers of opium uh, uh, to calm them down. I think we need to look at these things in the historical perspective and not with the eyes of 2023. Let me explain what I mean. Mm -hmm. One the opium trade existed 200 years before the Sassoons uh, arrived. The British started it. The opium war that ended the first, there were two opium wars. The first opium war ended in 1841, 1842, and opium became legal, not only in India and China, but across the world. Until 1907, you could go to any pharmacy in New York, London, or Paris and tell the pharmacist that you have a headache or indigestion, and there is a very good chance that you will be prescribed some opium. Um, second, opium became 16% of the revenues of India and was quoted as any other commodity like gold or silver. Even when religious groups began to put pressure on the British government to ban it, um, a commission of inquiry was created in 1893. It went on for five years, interviewing hundreds, if not thousands of people, published seven volumes, which is an amazing source about opium study of that period. And believe it or not, the conclusion was very straightforward. All this is an exaggeration. 
about the evil of the opium and compared it to alcohol. And the uh, witnesses who came before the commission, medical experts, doctors said, if you're banning opium, then you should ban alcohol. I will let your imagination think when British Parliament heard that there will be no whiskey, how they reacted to that. Uh, two things that I did, did not know. Well, there were many, but two of them that are part of this was the eventual taking over of the opium business by the Chinese and the attempt of the Sassoons to remarket their opium to the French. Yeah, I mean, what was happening also, there was a lot of politics. So the Chinese kept saying you need to stop the opium because it's impacting our population, which was a true fact um, because more and more people were getting addicted. But every time Indian production went down, Chinese local production went up. In fact, if you look at the data by 1900, the trade from India to China was really minuscule, but the um, both the production and the consumption of opium did not unfortunately go down a lot in, in, in China because of the local production. What happened with regard to what you mentioned about the French, all those traders, David Sassoon and others, uh, got stuck with chest of opium that they have purchased before the full ban entered in the early 1900. Um, and given the fact that they couldn't do anything with it, they tried to. The French were still allowing uh, opium trade in their territories like Vietnam. Uh Two of the things that struck me, uh, one, and they're related, uh, it's the anti-Semitism, as it was expressed, and I'm going to read a short passage, but the role of anti-Semitism uh, in Asia that they found and what they found when they tried to become British. Uh, I was very struck by that picture of them and, and a line that you have in the book that talks about that the immigrants and the upper class are not so much judged by their city houses as their country estates. And I saw a Jewish family looking more Scottish than the Scottish uh, in that picture that you showed and that sense of fighting for assimilation. But despite it, you have this remarkable uh, quotation by Countess Warwick that says, we resented the introduction of the Jews into social set of the Prince of Wales, not because we disliked them, but because they had brains and understood finance. As a class, we do not like brains. As for money, our only understanding of it lay in the spending, not the making. Uh, Tell me about the anti-Semitism well, um, we encountered. It's very interesting. I mean, so you have two conflicting forces at, at that time. There is no doubt anti-Semitism was rampant. On the other hand, here comes a family like the Sassoon. And believe it or not, in a relatively quick period, they are more accepted than the Rothschilds. And this really partly related to anti-Semitism. Why? Number one, they were never in the money lending or the money brokers or brokerage business. So this concept of the Jew as the money lender did not exist. Second of all, the British aristocracy did not like, you know, people going from low level so part of the society to the upper crust um, because they didn't like what we call nouveau riche. Well, the Sassoons did not fit that. They were merchant princes called in India. And before that, they were in the upper crust of, of the uh, Ottoman Empire. So they felt like they are dealing with, with the same kind of, of society uh, structure. The last thing, which is really very important, Remember what was going on in Europe at the end of the 19th century and World War I. Wars and wars and wars. Um, with the Rothschilds, there was this issue of loyalty. Well, 
who are you loyal to? You live in Britain, but your brother is in France, your cousin in Germany. Are you with us? Are you with them? One day you're lending us money. One day you're lending them money. With the Sassoon, there was no such a thing. It was all 100% British. So, for example, their business, their reputation was never touched during uh, uh, the World War I. I think also the atmosphere in Britain was in a funny way different from the 21st century. There was far more acceptance of talented immigrants who are willing to work hard in this whole liberalism and the Manchester School of Thought called for that. The final thing is when your friend is the Prince of Wales and you are um, his most esteemed guest day and night, and he's spending time with you. In a way, it's weird because there were attacks on him more than on the Sassoon. The attacks on him, why are you spending so much of your time with these foreigners? Um, To them was really that issue rather than the Sassoon trying to ingratiate themselves with the royal family. It existed, but it's still remarkable what they have achieved when you think about it. They left Baghdad in 1830, in 1870s, they, they, they became sirs. Um, Albert's son becomes a member of parliament. Uh, Philip Sassoon becomes under secretary for the Air Force in the 1920s, and so on and so forth. And the newspapers. And the newspaper, and Rachel Bear Sassoon, Here is the most amazing thing. Women were not allowed to vote in Britain during the world at the time in 1916. And here is this woman who was the editor of the main newspaper in Britain. Check when the first time a woman run became an editor in the United States. Between Flora and Rachel, you have an extraordinary role that women play. Yeah. I mean, really, the, the story with with the role of women in in the family is absolutely fascinating. Uh, You mentioned the Rothschilds. There was some intermarriage with the Rothschilds, and I'll get in a moment to intermarriage uh, out of the faith by the third generation. But the Rothschilds still seem to be around, and there was a precipitous drop uh, after World War II in terms of the Sassoons. Would you compare and contrast those fates? Yeah, I mean, I think that David Sassoon made his biggest mistake by writing a will, appointing the oldest son and believing that this tradition will go on. It did not go on. And three years after his death, there was the split. I think what really distinguished the Rothschild is this concept that they created a trust. So you are a member of the family just because one person is divorcing and another one is dying. The money doesn't get or the capital doesn't keep getting split and split again. And that really what happened with the Sassoon. Third generation was not working hard and was not accumulating wealth. People were dying. There is inheritance or estate taxes of 40 to 60 percent. Then none of the children could buy their siblings. So all these beautiful houses and country houses had to be sold in order to uh, divide by four or five. And you could see mathematically how within four generations you deplete all the assets. The great thing about the Rothschild that they managed to keep it. So if you're not talented or you're talented but not in business, you got a share, but you don't walk away with that share upon marriage or divorce or death or on, on. And and that really what kept it going. Um, And there were always people who were interested in the business. It seems more than the third and fourth generation of the Sassoons. One of the great and heartbreaking lines that you quote is one of the Sassoons saying, the most important race is not the Jewish race, but the Derby. Which is the horse race. The horse race. And that seemed to be emblematic of a change of focus that was generational. Yeah. I mean, the other thing which I quote 
is a letter that I found by two members of the third generation. We went to the office at 11 o'clock. At 1 p.m., we headed to uh, the club for lunch and then at 3 p.m. for horse races. So I thought David Sassoon was turning in his grave, thinking that members of his family are working two hours. Remember, the first and second generation worked 16, 15 hours a day, six days a week. And so that tells you really the whole story. Uh, two things before we get to the questions and comments. One is they were clearly aware of the Dreyfus affair and what was happening uh, in Europe and not simply in Eastern Europe, but in uh, in Western Europe. And the whole idea of Zionism seems to have been um somewhat abstract to much of the family. And you began to see intermarriage. Uh, the parents of Siegfried Sassoon, the, uh, the, the famous poet, uh, uh, were for a bit uh, cast off because of intermarriage. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, how, that, how that worked and what their relationship was to Judaism writ large, as opposed to the focus that they had in India and uh, in China. Yeah, I mean, marriages play a lot of role in all dynasties. On one hand, you consolidate. On the other hand, you know, especially for the first, the second generation would not accept under any circumstances marriages out of the faith. By the fourth gen, by the third generation, no one was marrying anyone from Baghdad. If they were marrying, they were marrying either European Jews or um, non-Jews. And uh, exactly the example you gave, Siegfried Sassoon is a case study of the fourth generation. Uh, father was thrown out of the family, cut off because he married an English woman. Um, lost contact with his family, which was really sad and tragic. Um, I described the connection for the first time when he's at his deathbed and he hasn't seen his his mother for almost 20 years. Um, but at the same time, here is a child who grew up not knowing that his ancestors are from Baghdad because of shame of being Oriental. And um, you have picked a better name than Siegfried exactly. uh, to get away from Abdullah. Yeah, we have a lot of chats and Q&A, I see. OK, so one final thing, and that is uh, where do you see the family, uh, perhaps yourself included uh, today and playing what role? And then we'll go. There is the really no such a thing. I mean, there are members of the family scattered all around the world, but there is no business. There is no entity as so soon. There is a name and there is a history. And now there is a book. OK, uh, let's go to the questions. Um, uh, R.S. Patel asks, is there any connection between the Sassoon family and uh, Rabbi uh, Abdullah Samach, any connection with the uh, Magan David uh, Synagogue in Mumbai, India, constructed by David Sassoon for Baghdadi Jews? Yeah, I mean, um, the interesting thing that uh, uh, the Bikula, the, the Magen David was built by David Sassoon because it was close to his house and he could go there uh, on the Fridays and Saturdays to pray. Um, similarly, he did the same thing in Pune. Um, I, I think that um, the connection to rabbis from, especially from Baghdad, uh, was very, very strong. Uh, some rabbis came in, some rabbis stayed there. But Baghdad continued to be kind, the religious and spiritual home for the first and second generation. Uh, thank you. Uh, Sherry Bachman asks, what does the Latin on the crest mean uh, in English? Uh, candid and constante is candid is is truth and constante forever. So you need this truth and 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 trust. Yeah, the the uh, Emet, uh, MS and uh, Emma. and Numa, uh, possibly truth and faith, the way it gets used uh, often. Uh, often today, and they mean very much, I think, the, the same thing. 
Stan Myers asked, can you talk about how the Sassoon family uh, rescued Jewish refugees in Shanghai? Well, I mentioned it in the sense they didn't physically rescue. They helped in the rescue efforts that were taking place in Shanghai as these people arrived from countries like Germany or Austria or other places in Europe with really nothing similar to the Sassoons when they left with nothing in 1830, um, given the fact that uh, Victor Sassoon was one of the richest people in the city. He contributed a lot, both financially and by organizing um, all kind of uh, uh, training uh, for these people. Jonathan Roth asked, as I did when we first met, uh, any relation to the Vidal Sassoon uh, that we know out here? Most know him as a hair cutter who made a lot of money. But those of us who've been involved in Israeli charities uh, and Israeli issues also knew him through his involvement, very active involvement with Israel. None whatsoever. Uh, Vidal Sassoon is um, from Aleppo. There is absolutely no connection. You Baghdadis just don't talk to Halabis, do you? I I I, I, under, I understand. Uh, yeah. Linda Blank asks, what caused the family to lose its wealth? Well, I think the loss of identity that I talked about, I think the loss of the drive, the, the work ethics, I think also the loss of identity of being who they are. Um, I mean, I don't know whether they really woke up in, in the 1930s and really believed that they were British for everything and aristocrats. Um, somewhere, somehow, their brain really was much more focused on that than on the business. And, and the family paid a price for that. The, the lure of that goddess Britannia really seems to have uh, led them down a path but also there's a cliche in, in America about uh, generational, about shirt sleeves to tuxedos to the next generation uh, back in shirt sleeves. And they're chasing after, I guess, the English dream seems to have been a good part of their ruination as they lost focus. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, every refugee family uh, or immigrant family wants to be uh, accepted, wants to settle down. Their reaction was no different. They wanted to be accepted first in India. When they got accepted in India, there was for them or what they perceived a higher prize. That is to be accepted, not only to be accepted in Britain, but to be accepted by the upper level society. But there was never, as far as I could read, there was never in India or in uh, China, as, as, as far as I can see, the kind of assimilation where they took local names, local dress, local food and, right. became, uh, and became more Indian than the Indians, more Chinese than the Chinese. hundred hundred percent. It's a very important point. Yes, they felt part of India. They loved India. They gave to India, but they never they wanted to see themselves from day one as British citizens, Brit loyal uh, uh, citizens of the empire. And that's a big difference. Rita Lowe asks, was there a relationship with the Kaduri family? Yeah, so this is very, very interesting. The Kaduris and many others of these successful business people actually were hired by the Sassoon. Remember that document that I showed you. This is where they needed to hire people from Baghdad who could write and speak that language. At some point later on, when I showed you the, 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 the spread geographically, the fact that the pool of talent was restricted to Baghdad hurt the business. Kaduri was one of those people who were hired, um, arrived in, in, in uh, Hong Kong or Shanghai after a few years, left uh, the Sassoon and set up on his own. Um, and then I compare at the end of the book their demise with the rise again of the Kanduris. The Kanduris were interned. They lost also a lot of the money, similar to the Sassoons by nationalizations in China. Yet they restarted everything and they reached a new highs 
uh, by the end of the 20th century. There was another person who became the wealthiest, uh, Hardun, who became very Chinese, who uh, uh, converted to Buddhism, spoke, mm -hmm. married a Chinese woman, and he became a fascinating story in itself um, in the sense of, of becoming you know, starting with the Sassoon and ending up wealthier than anyone else. Uh, thank you. Rob Cohen asks, how did the Japanese occupation of China affect Sassoon's business and his ability to rescue Jews from, who had come from Europe? So this is really a fascinating uh, uh, aspect of the story. Um, the Japanese didn't know what to expect from the Jews. They came with all these anti-Semitic um, uh, ideas that the Jews control everything. So the first six, nine months, they were really romancing Victor Sassoon, thinking, OK, if Victor, who's a wealthy Jew, will like the Japanese, then uh, the doors of Britain and the U.S. would be open and they would be allowed uh, uh, to occupy China. Um, their patience ran out after uh, about six to nine months, and the situation began to deteriorate. Victor uh, left uh, uh, Shanghai, uh, but erroneously, he misread really all the leaves. He believed that China will not enter World War II. He believed that uh, uh, sorry, Japan will not enter World War II, that Japan will never attack the U.S. As we all know, both are wrong. Um, and devastation took place. I mean, when the war ended in 1945, Shanghai was not the same glitzy, glamorous city that everyone wanted to be. Uh, Shanghai was destroyed. Inflation was like 6,000% poverty, um, lack of jobs. And then it finished and immediately you had a civil war between the nationalists and the communists. So really for almost 10 years from 39 to 49, it was you know going one way. And of course, the final blow for the Sassoon part of the business in in, in China came with the nationalization of all their assets. There were something like 14, 15 buildings. Uh, that big building that I showed you, um, I think there was in the Wall Street Journal about seven, eight years ago, an estimate that it was worth $3 billion. Chinese, I mean, there was no compensation, not just for the Zoom, but no foreign entity ever received any compensation. For the, and the hotel certainly is beautifully located. The hotel is beautiful. In fact, you can stay in the Sassoon presidential suite for $15,000 a night. You know, I passed when I had that opportunity. Uh, there's a personal question here. Feel free simply to duck if you don't want, want to or answer it. But Carol uh, Smart asks, are you the brother of Gerald Sassoon? No. And do you have anything to do with the Sassoon denim business? No, that's another misnomer. There is no connection to the de denim uh, uh, business. Or no, they or did, and we skipped this. They did go into after the American Civil War and the kind of decimation of agriculture and the end of slavery in the South during Reconstruction. They went into uh, the cotton business and into the cloth business. Uh, and that was at least an attempt to diversify uh, out from the opium business and to get into the American market with both technology and with product, which seems to that it should have been a good and permanent uh, move. We're yeah, down to our last seconds. So let me ask the, the, the final question, uh, which is, has there been any interest in making a film about the family? If you have ideas and you know a producer in Hollywood, we're open for business. Well, if we've got a thousand people on this call, uh, 1,500 of them are in the business. <laughs> uh, and uh, with that, uh, we're going to, um, unfortunately, have to say goodbye. It has been an honor and a pleasure. I loved the book. Thank you. You have the ability, uh, audience, to look for this book and its link uh, to get it on Amazon. Uh, yes, there are pictures. They're helpful. 
Uh, and there's one more thing that he does. Uh, I'm talking about you as if you weren't here, that Joseph does that's very, very smart. Because you have repetition of names, various Davids, you have changes of names from Arabic uh, to uh, English, from a fara to a flora. There is in front of each chapter a little family tree that lets you follow the names and the relations of the players who are being uh, covered in that particular chapter. This is wonderful reading and an interesting story. I thank you for your time and I thank you for this book. It has been quite a pleasure to read and to uh, begin to know you. Thank, thank you, you very you. much, Joseph. Thank you to the American Jewish University again for arranging and hosting this. Much appreciated. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS pledge line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.